Hello, gentlemen. So the plan today is that we are actually going to be starting unit two. Um, I know that we are going to be moving into next week a 100% um, classroom. However, I do want to talk about some of my plans to continue, um, which I'll talk more about it with you probably in class. I do plan on recording lectures still. I think that it really helps you kind of grasp the information a little bit better and you have something to go back on in case you missed it in the notes. So I'm hoping that I will continue to do that. I am actually trying something new in this lecture to see if that benefits us in any way. So please give me feedback if you like that or if you did not like that. For those of you that have taken the test or have not taken the test yet, I do want you to remind I want to remind you to take this first test as an opportunity that yes, it's open note. However, not all of our tests will be open note. So if you tended to struggle in a certain area, then hopefully you can learn from those mistakes. I do hope that you took the time to study because when you record notes versus understanding your notes, it really makes a difference. So if you took a lot of notes, however, you did not know what you were doing, um, you may have had a hard time on the test. So please make sure that you're taking those into consideration and growing and improving your um, integrated science um, outlook and how you study for things or how you complete your assignments. I am hoping since we um, move on into a 100%, I'm going to actually be going through and giving you a lot more feedback on your completion homework, um, but we'll see. I'm hoping that I can do a lot more uh, physical copies of stuff. I feel like it makes it a little bit easier for grading and feedback, um, but also just making sure I hand things out to you effectively. If you have any questions from your test, um, let me know. However, today we're going to be going over Unit 2, so we're going to discuss scientific notation and factor conversions and correct number of digits from calculations. Um, so it's a lot of information. It is a little bit of a longer lecture, but it helps us set the base for next week when we do our lab. So first thing we're going to do is scientific notation. What I would like you to do excuse me, is I want you to pause this video right here, and I actually want you to go complete the Ed Puzzle um, because we will be doing two examples here in a moment. So please pause the video and go watch the Ed Puzzle. I have it posted on Canvas or it's in our Ed Puzzle class. All right, I'm assuming that you've done it. So first things first, with scientific notation, what you always want to remember is you kind of have excuse me, I'm going to use a pen here. With the end of a decimal, like right here, you always have a decimal here. So what you want to do is you're going to count one, two, three, four, five, six. As a reminder, you always want your coefficient to be from one through 999. Um, you don't want to have a coefficient of 10. So you want to make sure that your decimal, you have one non-zero number right there and then you have your rest, the rest of it. So first things I had six. Because my number is getting bigger, I'm going to use a positive exponent. So I get 1.28 times 10 to the sixth. Because it's a large number, I use that positive exponent to denote that when I have my decimal here, if I want to put it in non-scientific notation, I would head to the right to get that bigger number. Down here, I have my decimal. I'm getting smaller, so and because I'm getting smaller, I know my my exponent has to be negative. So I have to have a negative exponent, but first let's count. So we have one, two, three, four, five. My decimal is right there. I get the exponent of negative five, so I have 2.8 times 10 to the negative five. I have a small number. It's a negative exponent. It denotes that when I'm trying to get it out of scientific notation here, I will actually be heading to the left to make it a smaller number. When you're using your calculator for scientific notation, what's important to note is you're never going to use your operator buttons right here. Do not use those unless you are doing the um, multiplication, division, addition, or subtraction sign in the middle of the two scientific notation numbers. You're actually going to use what we call our EE or second EE button. If you use this calculator, you don't have an EE button. They look like this right here. So you would actually hit our second button in this corner and you'd find your EE and that's how you would do it. When you do a um, negative you have to use your change sign in the bottom. So it looks like this, or it might have a positive to negative, negative to positive. You do not want to use your subtraction sign on your operator buttons. You'll get a syntax error. So make sure that you practice with your calculator. I do have two um, practice equations that we are going to run through to help you. But if you have issues, please come see me, and I can help correct those. So let's practice. 
So if I want to put this in my calculator, which this is important why you have a calculator and not just take one from me. So make sure you get a calculator if you do not have one. There's a big like back to school sale going on right now, like at Walmart. You literally can get them for pretty cheap. Make sure you get a calculator this weekend if you do not have one. So first things first, I'm going to put in my 3.4. I have my times 10 here. I'm gonna do my second EE. My second EE button, my EE button is a times 10, and then I add my exponent. That makes it so it kind of stays in a quantity. So I'm gonna hit second EE. So it should look a little something like this. And then I will actually put in information here for my exponent. So right now it should look like this. I'm going to go see what I'm doing. It looks like I'm multiplying. So now I'm going to use my operator buttons and hit multiplication. And I will do the same process. I'll put in 7.9, second EE, 21. So it looks a little like that. I will hit the enter button. And the nice beauty part about this is it gives you their answer in exponent form. So here I'm going to round up to two decimal places. So we're one decimal place, so two point, because it's a bigger than five, I can round so I get 2.7 times 10 to the 31. Now I want you to take the opportunity to do this. Remember with your negative, you do want to use your change sign. So do not use the operator button for subtraction, use your change sign. All right, the answer for this one is 2.8 times 10 to the negative 20. If you did not get that, try in practice again. However, if you have a hard time with these, please reach out to me. All right, factor conversions. This one is going to be a little bit difficult um, because it is something new. So I'm going to show you the steps and then I actually tried something new and I'll show you how to do the work. So the first steps that we have is you're going to determine, number one, determine the given and the want, and you're going to put them on opposite ends of what we call a train track. I will show you what that looks like, um, but for now, just kind of follow these steps with me, write them down, because it'll be a lot of help when I go through the example with you. You are going to write, for number two, you're going to write your given units on opposite sides so they cancel out. Again, I will show you what this looks like. Three, you're going to write your conversion fraction, and then you will multiply across, then divide. I know this looks confusing. That's why I'm going to show you what, how to do it with an example. But what's important to note, and write this down, please, this is very important. This is our conversions right here. My unit here is my base unit. So let's say I wanted mass. This is my grams right here. And anything I add denotes if it's what type of it is. So here's a deci centimilli. So think about when you do an, um, when you take like ibuprofen, it's in milligrams. Milligrams is right here. One gram is equal to a thousand milligrams. Oh, I love, I love the look of that. I'm so sorry. So one gram here is equal to a thousand milligrams. And it goes by 10. So I multiply by 10. So my deci is 10. My centi is a hundred and my milli is a thousand. Now, if I was going up here, actually, I would actually be dividing by 10. So in this case, 10 grams would be equal to one deca, and 100 grams would be equal to one hecto, and 1,000 would be equal to one kilo. So it's just important to really practice and know like, hey, I'm going up by tens. This one, it's like you divide by 10, you divide by 100, you divide by 1,000, or it's one kilo is equal to a thousand grams. Whereas here with the bottom, it's one gram is equal to a thousand milligrams or a hundred centigrams or a hundred decigrams. You're going to use this a lot, so please make sure you have a copy of this in your notes. With factor labeling, we're going to do this as an example. You measure out 34 milliliters of water. How many liters is this? When you do these, there is a decimal sliding method. However, you will not use that. You will actually be using the fractions because we will be developing these and making them a little bit difficult as we go on. So it's important to really grow comfortable train tracks. So again, here it is. If you do not have it down, please get this written down. It's important. So here's my new thing. I'm actually going to be, I'm going to get rid of that. Automatic. Okay. 
So this is my new thing. I recorded myself doing it in advance and I will go through and talk with you. So our example is you measure 34 milliliters of water. How many liters is this? Our step one was our determine your given and your want. So you're going to go to your example and you're gonna find out, hey, what's my given? 34 milliliters is my given. And the way that I know this is my given is always gonna have a number. So here I have 34 milliliters. So I know that has to be my given. So it's like my starting unit in a way. And then I need to determine my want, and that actually is liters. And how I know that's my want is a dead giveaway in the question because I have the words how many. So how many did like denotes like, hey, these are the lead, this is the unit I want. This case, I'm going from milliliters to liters. So step two, I'm gonna write your given and want on opposite sides so they cancel out. So I write down my 34 milliliters and I write down my liters. That's where I'm going. This is where my train track comes in. So it looks a little like this. And a way to know it kind of looks like two fractions next to each other. So I talked about wanting your given on opposite sides. So your milliliters will be on the top. And your liters will always be on the top right hand. Next, we need to make our conversion. So to do that, I'm actually going to use my steps again that I kind of already talked about. So here I'm drawing out the steps. So that way you can get a vis visual copy. So give me a second while I write that down. So I have my milliliters, my centiliters, my deciliters, my unit, my base unit, my deca, hecto, and kilo. So my base unit is always going to start where the U is. So in this case, my base unit is liters. And think about where it's deciliters, centiliters, milliliters. So I need to find, hey, where's my starting unit or where's my negative unit versus where I'm going. And having my conversion down will help me determine what my conversion is. So in this case, I'm starting with milliliters. Um, so I know I'm on the bottom. So I want to see how many milliliters are in one liter. So to do that, I will actually start where my liters are at and I'll count down how many steps I go. And in this case, I know if I'm going down those steps, I'm multiplying by 10 each time I go down. So I have 10 times 10 times 10, and that actually equals 1,000. So because my milliliters are below, I know one liter is, the liters are bigger than milliliters, and so I know one liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters. So there I have my conversion written down. So I'm going to plug all this information into my train track now to help with solving it. So here I plugged it in. I want to cancel my units out for my milliliters and my liters, which I think I do show an example of this. So here I want to make sure my milliliters are diagonal. So that way when I go through and I finalize it, I will divide through. So here I'm going to multiply across and I'm going to multiply um, both on the top and the bottom. So I would do 34 times 1 liter and divided by 1,000 milliliters. So here I'm writing it down. Here's where you can see that canceling out of the units though, because when I have these together, if I'm dividing two types of units together, so here in this case my milliliters, I actually cancel them out. So think about when you can cross cancel out in a fraction. That's what I'm doing essentially, but I'm showing you in two ways how you can see that. And I wanna make sure I'm left with the units that I want. So in this case, I want liters. So I'm gonna multiply 34 times one on the top. So I get 34 liters and I'm dividing by the thousand that's left over. I do the math in my calculator and I end up with the final answer of, oh, Yep, plug 34 liters, divide by 1,000 in your calculator if you have not. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Beautiful. So final answer is 0 0.034 mil, like liters, excuse me. I can box that, and I am good to go for this problem. There we go. So remember, you always put the unit that you want on top, and you're always going to do that on top on the right-hand corner. Your larger unit gets the 1, as your smaller unit gets the zeros. 
Here's another example, so I want you to try this on your own. There are 456 grams of copper on the balance. How many kilograms is this? Pause the video and complete it. I'm going to start explaining it. Step one, we need to identify the given and our wanted. I go to my, my example. I see 456 grams. I know that's my given because of my number that is there. I need to find my wanted. I know my wanted is kilograms. And again, it's because of my keywords of how many. I want to know how many kilograms from 456 grams. Step two, I'm going to write out my given and wanted with the units so they cancel. So I'm going to make my train track and I'm going to plug in my 456 grams of copper and I'm going to plug in the unit that I want to end with. Again, my starting one will be in the top left. My final one will be in the top right. I know that my given is on this side. My want is on this side. I need to cancel out my given units. So as a reminder, the units will be in the bottom right hand corner. So I'm gonna make sure I put grams in the bottom right hand corner so I can cancel out my units. So step three, I do want to do my factor conversion. Oh goodness, I have no course. I want to figure out my factor conversion, so I'm going to do my steps. Again, I'm going to make sure I start with my base unit, and I'm going to write down, I want to end up at the top, I'm going to kilograms. So as a reminder, you're technically dividing by 10 as you move up, or if I'm going to go to the right and move down, I will be multiplying by 10. In this case, I'm going up, so I count how many times I go up. Here, I find it easier to actually just multiply by my tens and then determine what's my bigger unit. So in this case, I get a thousand again. But my kilograms is bigger than my grams. And so I will find the conversion of one kilogram equal to a thousand grams. And I found that using my step stool method. So one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. I'm going to plug my conversion in to my train track. Plug it in, I'm gonna multiply across by the top, multiply across through the bottom, and I get 456 grams times one kilogram, all divided by a thousand grams. I want to make sure my units cancel, so I'm going to check my gram units. I got one on the top, one on the bottom. So I am going to cancel those out because I did lend up with my kilogram, so I know that I am good to continue. I'm going to multiply 456 by 1 to get 456 kilograms. I'm going to divide that by 1,000. I'm going to plug this into my calculator. Now, take right, the writing part takes a little bit when I'm not writing it. I pre-recorded this, so. And I should get a final answer of zero point four five six kilograms. I like to check my example. So here, it's always important you want to make sure that you're ending up in the correct units. I want to make sure I'm ending up in kilograms so I can check back onto my work and see, hey, I ended up with kilograms um, in my final work. My grams canceled out. So I know for a fact, hey, I ended up with kilograms, so I am correct, and I can box my answer in because I am complete. So right there is our second example. If you have a hard time or you have any questions, please email me with your questions. So I do have to move into our next topic. Here, I want to know how do you determine the correct number of digits in a measurement? Please take a moment to think about it, and then we'll discuss it. To determine your correct number of digits, remember you're going one past the final measuring point that you can see easily, um, and that's when you have your estimated digit. Understanding the correct number of digits in your measurement with your estimated digit will really help you with solving your correct number of digits for answers 
um, when you're completing the math. So I want you to notice here, what about if I combine measurements? So I take 1.25 milliliters plus 53 milliliters and I get 54 milliliters. I take 4.98 grams minus 3.1 grams, I get 1.9 grams. I take 1.29999999999 meters plus 1.5 meters and I get 2.8 meters. When adding and subtracting, what's the pattern that you notice? If you do not notice it, I'm actually using the least amount of decimals that are present for the numbers. So for my first one here, I have two decimals and here I have zero decimals. So my final answer, because zero is less than or greater, less than two, excuse me, I'm going to have my final answer with no decimals. Here I have two decimals. Here I have one decimal. One decimal is um, not greater than two decimals, and so I'm going to end my answer with one decimal. Here I have a lot of decimals, and here I have one decimal, so my final answer will have one decimal. What about if I multiply divide? I get six milliliters for my first one, 0 0.380 grams for my second one, and 2.02 .02 meters squared for my last one. When multiplying and dividing, the pattern is actually to use your least amount of sig figs, which I know that that does not make sense. And so I will actually be showing you, hey, here's how you determine the least amount of sig figs. So here, make sure you write this down. Addition and subtraction rule, fewer decimal places, multiplication and division, fewer total numbers or sig figs. Your answer must reflect the less precise measuring device. So an example of that, is student one masses an object on this balance, it reads 10.9 grams. Student two masses an object on this balance, it reads 11.778 grams. What are the object's total mass and how many digits can the answer have? So first off, when I'm taking total mass, I'm adding them together. So make sure you take a second to add them together. I want you to determine the fewest amount of decimals and then I want you to write it down in your notebook and then we will discuss. So when I add them together, I get 22.678 grams. However, I'm adding them, and I need to have my final answer with the correct amount of digits. In this case, it's actually one decimal place. So I should end up with 22.7 grams because my least amount of decimals is one compared to my three. There are some weird rules with zeros, which I'm going to discuss similar to my examples. So we call these significant figures, and this is where our weird rule with zeros example begins. Oh, I knew it was going to happen. So the first thing that you need to know is if you think about it, the United States has two coasts, and on those coasts we have two oceans. We have the Pacific Ocean, and we have the Atlantic Ocean. And I have a little bit of waves because they're oceans. So we know, like, hey, they're on this side of the United States. It's pretty, pretty easy. However, we can use this example, and it will help us determine how do we determine significant figures for our numbers. So I'm going to erase these. We know Pacific is on the left side. Atlantic is on the right side. And so I can actually say, hey, P and A. The P would represent now, I'm gonna, if my decimal point is present in the number that I'm given. So if P represents my decimal is present, my A would represent if my decimal is absent. So it is not there. I do not have a decimal, or if I do, I cannot see it. It's at the end of my number. So if it's present, I'm actually going to be counting from the left, and if it's absent, I'm counting from the right. So, so let's do some examples because it's easier to see how to solve this by going through with some examples. So if I had 0 0.00101, I have to determine is my decimal present or absent. Here I can see my decimal is present. So I'm actually going to use that arrow and I'm going to be canceling out until I hit my first non-zero number. 
if once I hit my non-zero number, it acts as a wall and it protects any zeros that are past that point. So here I'm going to go through and I'm going to cancel out all my zeros with my arrow. I spelled cancel out, cancel wrong. Ha ha ha, it happens. So here we go, we're going to cancel out till we hit a non-zero number. Oh gosh, why am I surprised? I'm not surprised. Oh goodness. All right, here we go. So I draw my arrow and I start canceling out my zeros and I hit a one. So I cancel that out. And once I hit there, I'm gonna count how many numbers I have remaining. So in that case, I count one, zero, one. Here we go, we're gonna do that. So, so I'm gonna count how many numbers are left. So in this case, I go back to my one, zero, one. Oh man, I'm surprised. I count and I get one, two, three. So in this number, I have three significant figures. And that zero is in the middle, which is a little funky. Um, however, that is okay because that one walks acts as a barrier and it protects that zero from being canceled out. So now let's do an example. What if you don't have your decimal, oh my gosh, present? So let's say I, I have 410, so decimal is absent. And so I'm going to actually count from the right hand. So I'm going to cancel out all my zeros until I hit a non-zero number. So I'm going to cancel out my zeros and bam, I hit a one. Now that I've canceled out all those zeros going up and I've hit a non-zero, I'm going to count how many numbers are in the final area. In this case, I have two, so I have two sig figs remaining. I'll go through another example. Oh yeah, if zeros are left after, we count those. So for example, how many significant figures are in this number here? My decimal is present, and so I can cancel out coming from the left-hand side. Those zeros will actually stay. They cannot be canceled out because the four acts as a barrier. And so I would end up with four significant figures for this number. These zeros will count in this significant figure because it acts as a wall. So now I want you to do these examples here. Um, look at our side slide example. This one right here, we have 401. Our decimal is absent. So I'm gonna go through and cancel to our first non-zero number. Right away, I don't have to cancel any zeros. I have one, and so I count my sig figs there, and I have three. I go down to my 400, my decimal is absent, and so I'm gonna cancel out and I'm gonna go to the four. Four, I only have one, so I count that, and that is my sig figs. My next one, my decimal is present, so I'm gonna cancel out to my first non-zero number. I do that, I hit four, and I count, I get two. And then my bottom one, my decimal is present, I'm gonna cancel to my first non-zero number, I hit four, I'm good, I count my sig figs, and I get three. If you needed a, a idea, here's your weird rule. If it's in the middle of two numbers, it would count. If the decimal is present, then you are absent, you would cancel those out. So blue means it does count, red means it does not count in those cases. Practice. All right, now I want you to take the opportunity to pause this and I want you to go through and practice these four and then I will give you the answers. All right, the first one we get 31 because that was with our least amount of sig figs. Our second one is fewer decimal places, so we get 21.5. Our third one is subtraction, so we get few decimal places, so we get 0 0.92. And our last one is multiplication, so we use our least amount of sig figs. All right. In that case, I couldn't round up because I did have 800, and so I had to stick with that number. 
but if you think about it, your decimals will, your present because it's absent, are going to cancel out those zeros. So I still have my least amount of sig figs. Do these four now. My first one is division, so I'm going to use least amount of sig figs in my final answer. My second one is addition, so I'm going to use fewer amount of decimals. My third one is a multiplication, so I'm going to use least amount of sig figs in my answer. And my last one is also multiplication, so I'm going to use least amount of sig figs as well. Now I'm going to use into our exponents, so please do these and practice them in your calculator. The first one, you should get 3.1 times 10 to the 10th. My second one, I should get um, 8.5 times 10 to the 31st. All right. For homework, you are going to complete the factor labeling worksheet on Canvas. And then I do ask you're prepared for a fun lab next week. That is our first week when we are 100% back with my freshmen. So I cannot wait to see you. Have a wonderful day. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Bye.